Hey, this is Daniel Patrick Brennan, and this is the Wine is Food podcast, and I am in uh, Bayview, uh, Hawke's Bay, New Zealand, with Gordon Russell from Esk Valley Wines. On the, co- on the coast in our lounge. On the coast in the lounge. We have a couple <laughs> producers here, like an audience <laughs> for us, you know, producer Pia and producer Mana. Uh, I think maybe only the second time we've had a little audience for the podcast, which is good, you know, keeps it relaxed. So. Oh, well, they're cooking and we can't uh, can't <laughs> stop the food, can we? So, um, Yes, so uh, I I uh, was got pretty excited because I knew we were going to do this sooner or later and I saw your picture on a window of a wine shop in Wellington and I thought, oh, this is like really getting serious <laughs> for my podcast if I got like, you know. Somebody who's you know lo- local, local, famous worldwide. You just got back well, from the U.S. Well, ha- right? how, how's this? I, I was in Auckland. I saw my picture on the front door as well, and I walked in, and they didn't recognize me. So, um, <laughs> put you back obvious, to obviously not that famous. <laughs> Brought you back to reality a little bit. Um, so, uh, I, I've done a bunch of these interviews uh, with mostly peers so far, and uh, I would say I would definitely categorize you as a mentor of mine or at least uh, somebody who uh, I look up to in winemaking. Uh, so this is the uh, first one I'm going to speak with Jenny Dobson tomorrow. So two people cool. who have helped me a lot in winemaking and I know uh, you were kind enough years ago where I just started emailing you about Malbec and you started talk, you know, give me some advice and I finally came up and met you and found out, uh, well, we, we have a lot of interest including music that we share yeah, yeah. and things like that. So. Um, here we are. Here we are. How did you? Uh, were you always at Esk Valley, or did you? Where, where well, else have you been? Well, I mean, I've been at Esk Valley for you know almost twenty years. I pretend I own it, yeah, um, <laughs> literally. But um, no, I, you know, you go back a long time. I mean, twenty years at Esk Valley. I was at Villa Maria before that, and then I worked at a small winery in Auckland before that. What so was I mean, that? this it was called Ballamore. Um, but had just cha- it, and ch- had changed its name from Balich Estate. So this is right back into the murky sort of, you know, the beginnings, the first stirrings of New Zealand wine industry as they are now. So, you know, I mean, it's been a 20, well, for me, 25 years um, involved in the wine industry. And, I mean, changes have been incredible. Yeah, yeah um, it's been so. night and day from what it was. Yeah. So I mean, when you were at that place, what varietals were you making there? Um, Muller Turgau, yeah, um, yeah that's you know, you know. <laughs> Chardonnay, um, Sauvignon Blanc from Gisborne, um, some, I can't remember what the reds were, but I'm assuming they were Cabernet. My, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they were, yeah, the beginnings of Cabernet and Merlot and, and so yeah. forth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, literally, I... <laughs> wanted a job in the wine industry and um they relented and gave me a job so mm-hmm. it was cool and then on the villa from was that up in auckland or yep. around here yeah yep. 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 um you know i mean it all, it all began i mean literally i i saw an ad in the paper and it was for a job at collards in west auckland and um Literally, I drove out to um, Henderson on my Suzuki 125 that I kind of owned at the time. It was just a big smoker and sort of smoked my way up the motorway to to Henderson. Rocked into Lionel Collard's office and Lionel was, you know, one of the institutions in the New Zealand wine industry at the time. Very conservative, probably in his 60s or something. There I, and I rocked jeans, hole in the knee. Um, leather jacket from ride my motorbike out there <laughs> sort of a a bad take on james dean and and i didn't get the job funnily enough oh no so i was gutted um quite honestly because and it just suddenly it, it made me realize what i want to do so the rest is just kind of fulfilling a dream yeah and what uh and eventually so in Villa, but then and then when you got to Esk Valley, this is sort of the, when, yeah. how long had it been Esk Valley at that stage? Um, George Fiston that you bought it in 1986, oh, and exactly. yeah, it started making wine again in '89. Um, I rocked in as assistant winemaker in 1990, okay, and then what 1993, just before harvest. Um, as luck would have it, my good friend um, 
Grant Edmonds, who's now over at Cellini, um, who was um, winemaker at the time, headed to Auckland, became chief winemaker of the Villa Group, mm-hmm. and um, left me behind to make the 1993 Harvester Desk. That was the first one. How was <coughs> that year? Oh, it was a shocker. <laughs> it, was, it was the one from hell, honestly. Yeah, it was, it, it was a fucking <laughs> shocker. Um, Terrible. The yields were pathetic. It rained the whole harvest. It, it was a shocker. But well, I, I showed up last year uh, to drop <clears> something <throat> off. I forget. And uh, you said, uh, "Oh, it was raining." I remember last year it just kept raining uh, in 2011 in Hawks Bay. And you, I think maybe you referenced that. You said, "I haven't seen it this bad since '93 or something." <laughs> yeah, it's still. I think rates is arguably the worst ever. Um, this year, I've had a fair crack at it, but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was a shocker. But I've got to say, the wines that we made, I think it was more um, luck than good management in some respect, but um, they really did quite well. We won a few Sorry. won a few gold medals. Um, and literally, I was on trial for that harvest. Um, winning a few gold medals after the harvest um, certainly helped the cause. So that yep. was it. So and they kept you on. Kept me on. And now you got your pictures on uh, window shops exactly. all over the country. Exactly. Um, and <coughs> vari- varietals you were working with then, where Esk was sort of yeah, I starting mean, to develop the, the traditional stuff then? Yeah, well, I mean, we'd, we'd started making Merlots. Malbecs had just started entering the picture. Um, Chardonnay, Hawke's Bay, Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, which we proudly proclaimed on the bottle, wood aged, um, made it more expensive. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, that was about it, really. Uh, uh, not to harp on too much on Malbec, but that was... I, I was surprised when I got here how much Malbec is here. I mean, it's not like heaps, but there's a, it seems like a decent amount proportionally, uh, whereas it's almost <coughs> a forgot... It was a forgotten varietal in France, except for what, you know, the... Um, yeah, c- cow whores cow and um, yeah. Yeah, there's a wee bit in Bordeaux as well. Um, I'm not quite sure how that all happened, actually. Um, it was... We planted terraces in, in what, 1989 um, with some Malbec, and we got the cuttings from Dennis Irwin at Matafero, and I think Matafero was probably the pioneer in New Zealand. Um, so his Bridge Estate wines from Gisborne, 19, what, 89, 90, I mean, just some of the great red wines ever made in New Zealand. Mm. Um, we put Malbec into the terraces, got a first crop in 91, and then in 1992, there was a parcel that came out of the Pask Vineyard, um, which we had at Esk, which I put into our reserve wine, and literally, I think, doing that, <coughs> which was in 1993, blending up that wine, 92 reserve wine, um, kind of, in some respects, set a new sort of style or benchmark for what is now a sort of typical Hawke's Bay blend, mm. really, of that sort of Merlot, Malbec, Cabernet, Merlot, Cabernet, Malbec, Merlot, Malbec, and so forth. So, really, I mean, that that was those early days back in the early 90s is where the sort of, I suppose, Hawke's Bay blend has, has come from. And who else? Was, I mean, so Tomato was around then? Who, who were yeah, the I mean, sort of... Yeah, I mean... Big, you know, big dogs or whatever. Who was doing it back then? What making making good wine? Yeah, I'll um, say that. Yeah, making good wine without leaving. A- <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, within the company, vital. Yeah. Um, fr- uh, Brookfields, um, Tomata, um, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna miss some Corbins. Um, you know, this was before the Gimlet Gravels. This sure. is before the Natara Triangle or anything like that. All of the um, vineyards out there. Um, really didn't exist. Um, Clearview, Tim was just starting. Yep. Um, so there weren't many. Um, Kim Salonius up in the Esk Valley at Estelle Wine Growers. Um, so, yeah. Spread all out. Um, Spread everywhere. Alan Limmer. Oh, sure, yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was um, Mission. So, I mean, we were, we were used to get together. We were quite strong as a tasting group, actually. Mm-hmm. Used to get together and sort of dark cellars and, and taste some pretty interesting wines, um, you know, as a group. And it's almost... Yeah, those those were kind of the the second wave, 
I'm, in some respect. I almost feel I was part of that second wave of Hawke's Bay winemakers. Mm-hmm. And prior to that, there was, you know, Alan and, and Paul Mooney and uh, Peter. Peter Cowley and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. So. Mm. And uh, when did you sort of see the next wave then coming with the, I guess, the development of the gravels and all yeah. that type of stuff? I mean, that, that all came really, I suppose, in uh, late... 90s into the 2000s and it's just the boom was kind of going then yeah um you know those those were i suppose good times lots of optimism Mm -hmm. um you know we were the world was short of wine at the time and um yeah i mean it's still it's it's always been interesting just things things change i mean you know you've seen it yourself i'm sure yeah i've seen stuff get lean and change around yeah. in the four or five vintages I've done here. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting just to see, you know, now Syrah seems to be really everybody's sort of flexing their muscles with that mm-hmm. uh, in the last few years. And that seemed like it just started going when I got here. It's that young, you know. Yeah, I think that I think that's fair comment. Um, and there still isn't that there isn't enough in the ground to satisfy demand. Yep. So it, it, it's kind of it, as things change you realize you know what you've got in your vineyard doesn't quite match with perhaps what cons- what the con- new consumer demand is mm-hmm. and you know you loathe and you never will pull out the best of your old vines and so forth but sometimes you kind of wish that that plot of underperforming merlot was planted in <laughs> planted in Syrah or or something different which had some current consumer appeal now you've done uh you know the terraces which is red line we just talked about syrah but you do a lot of interesting white wines at ask uh, um, well i think the two perhaps you could mention is interesting uh um vidalo mm-hmm. which has been really interesting i mean honestly that that started um as a a concept to make something which wasn't planted in new zealand and we we honestly thought that we were the first ever in history of you know of New Zealand literally to to make wine from Vidalo, or as I found out, it's Gadeo as well. So a Spanish name for it, um, Gadeo, which is becoming very popular um, from Buezo and sort of northwestern Spain. Um, Problem is, I read a book which was written in 1974 by a guy called Frank Thorpe uh, about two or three years ago, and it, in it it described that um, Romeo Brigato, when he was travelling New Zealand oh. in the 1890s, recorded Vidalo growing in the Waikato in Hawke's Bay. Oh. So innocence was a great thing. So we weren't the first; we were the first in a, a hundred years. Yeah, well, that's. I think that's true. And the other um, is Chenin Blanc, which you know is is kind of a a labor of love in some respect and it's kind of one of those unloved varieties which has a niche and we're part of the niche yeah i like it uh, uh, yeah there's always been a niche around for that work going back working in some restaurants i always liked shannon blanc and uh i want to make a i want to make a blend with it I've tried to do it this year, but it was just a you know a bit of a nightmare trying to organize it with all the vineyards dropping like flies. Yeah, yeah. But I was in, I really wanted to do a Chardonnay Chenin with a little bit of Viognier yep. uh, down the road. But so maybe I'll have to ask you where I can find some shit around because there's a, there's only a few a little bit around. I know. Yeah, I mean we we've got a couple of vineyards actually. Um, it's 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 funny. It's such an unloved variety, and that it, in, in a world which wants instant gratification and, and wines with, you know, intense bouquets and just, you know, uh, the more intensity, the better. Shannon sits out on a limb because it's kind of got subtle charms and its charms develop with time. I mean, it's it's out of fashion, but anyone who likes food and understands the world of the sommelier and so forth knows that Shannon Blanc makes food taste better yeah. and food makes it taste better. Mm-hmm. So... You know, it's it's something. It's it's an acquired experience mm-hmm. rather than taste. Um, uh, and we're drinking one now, which tastes pretty good to yeah, me, actually. Yeah, this is uh, an interesting wine we have here. So, uh, well, yeah. What what is this wine we're drinking now? Um, it's uh, Nicholas Jolie, 
um, 2008, and it's the Souvenir. Um, so it's, you know, the most dry, the most intense. It's it, it's the Le Mans Rocher of the Loire. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is generally the very pale, very mineral and take decades to show their best. But this being Nicolas Jolie, I mean, it's kind of... It, is it ready now or was it ready <laughs> two years ago or will it be better in 20 years? I mean, no one, including me, can answer those, yeah. you know, can answer those questions. <laughs> uh, interesting guy. And um, just off a trip to the U.S.? And yeah. Yeah, so yeah love it. Love Boston, going there. Connecticut and Florida. We'll yep. Get, we'll start with Boston because I spent a lot of time in Boston. Neptune Oyster Bar is my favorite restaurant if, um, or... Th- my favorite space in an eating establishment uh probably on the planet you like are you like in the oyster bar there oh th- i mean i love it i mean i love i love raw food i love the wine list i love the staff's enthusiasm i love the fact that you turn up to grab a seat and you literally have to come back in an hour and a half because it's so busy and they'll text you to tell you your seat is available and you can drink wine like um i i drank Basque wine. Um, I drank um, Loire wine. It's, you know, it's full of just interesting wine. Great, great seafood, and it's just amazing. I love mm, it. That's. I do miss a little bit of that. Um, so both. Yeah. Sorry. Going back, going so I got back. distracted. No, no, that's all right. I miss um, <clears throat> going back to the particularly well, California and the East Coast because you can get. You can look around and find awesome wines and restaurants like from anywhere in the world. You know, you're like, yeah. you know, really interesting wine lists. Um, but you know, I think it's good too in New Zealand that we dr- drink a lot of our own wines too. You know, yeah. support the industry that way. And there's, I guess, not the population to do it. But uh, unfortunately, most of my time I spent in Boston, I was dirt poor and sleeping on floors of colleges and touring with a band. And we, but we did a lot of spent a lot of time up there, and they sort of got to know all the different neighborhoods and all the areas really well but never really got to yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know hang it's out the, in any of the fancy places <laughs> but that place uh, is you know total legend in the area you know um, yeah I Boston's great I, I love the old cities of America mm-hmm. um, you know not in any way dissing Florida but you know it's it, it's, it's no, kind it's okay. of you can diss Florida <laughs> well, yeah, I mean I, I I don't want to because I want to sell a lot of wine sure, there and I can sure. see that we're you know we could sell a lot of wine there if, if we're not already but I love the old cities of America no, they're, Florida, they're just Florida's unique fantastic wine market actually because it's just people are eat, hanging it's holiday time all the time and they drink a lot the, even though people that stay there year round drink a lot, and so. what better wine than you know New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. we we only sell three wines into the US, so it's very tight portfolio that we we sell there. We got Sauvignon Blanc, we got Chardonnay, we got Merlot Cabernet, mm-hmm. and or Merlot Cabernet Malbec. And you know, I honestly, it was developed. The strategy was developed about what eighteen months ago when we went to the US, and it was um, Shadow Saint Michel, our um, distributors mm-hmm. in the US, and they made the decision to take Merlot Cabernet, and not the Pinot Noir that we make. And I mean, I I kind of thought, you know, um, Pinot Noir is the red wine of New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. generally, you know, I I don't necessarily agree with that because I think you know the Gimlet Gravels makes amazing wines of its type and i think that they are a new zealand legendary new zealand wine or wine style um it was decided that we'd take the merlot cabernet malbec and i thought god you know when i get there people are going to find the wine um you know under alcoholed under oaked um you know a little bit subtle for the american palate um with my knowledge of the american palate being um what 17 years as a subscriber to the wine advocate and to um uh wine spectator and i get there and find that there's shite loads of new zealand pinot noirs on the market and that our bordeaux styled wine with its elegance its lower alcohol less oak drinkability natural acidity and 
intense sort of perfume is an absolute winner. Yeah. And the fact that a Meritage blend, well, that's a real American term. I mean, no one here would know what a Meritage blend is. Or, I mean, I did. Um, the fact that it's Meritage blend, the hot category in the wine market, the fact that it's got Malbec in it, which is the hottest red grape Tell of the market, me, it's <laughs> like, it's like you know, El Dorado. We, yeah, we struck yeah. it. Nice. And, you know, I was there. I was doing um, um, a few staff training at um, Fleming Steakhouses. This is a sort of steak, uh, you know, big steakhouse chain. They're serving our wine, I think, in September, August or September, um, red wine by the glass. Mm. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, this to me, I, I, I love it. That's yeah. fantastic. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love going to the US. I, I just think it is such a almost naive wine market, which has so much potential. Yeah. No, I'm excited about it. I'm trying to do whatever I can. With oh, I'm sure, <laughs> absolutely. And Malbec's uh, a good place to start. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. I, I can't, I can't make enough of it right now. I'm only making, I think, last year 250 cases. But I mean, everybody we talk to, including people in Australia, are like, "Yeah, we want Malbec." It's yeah. Like, so I, I uh, but I almost. But you got to, you got to agree. The Hawke's Bay is one of the best places you could ever find to grow it. Um, well, the the. It gets ripe enough here, but it's still distinctly New Zealand that it just jumps out of the glass. Yeah. So, I mean, I gave you a bottle of my 09, which is basically a student wine. Yeah. And I sold all of that, and people were like, give me, give us more, give us more distributors because it's so unique, you know. Yeah. And, and it has, uh, and that was a really light one. But and I tell you what, uh, I thought, I in some respects thought light was bad, but light isn't bad at all because what i find some respect with um my experience with the other end of the spectrum um which is argentina and no disrespect to argentina i mean i think they make great wines but my general experience with them is that the more you pay the less i like the wines in some mm. respect because suddenly they just get more and more extracted the bottle gets heavier yeah. um and the oak just becomes absolutely just overpowering, and the wines become undrinkable. Yeah, I'm actually like completely fine with a nice, easy, light drinking food Malbec. You know, that's like the idea that I was like, well, yeah, this is seem this is nice. You know, and it's I think it's like a pleasant surprise to people when they they go for it. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying about uh, you know the red blend. Uh, from from Hawks Bay or, or Meritage is that it, it's you know it's uh, I went to California last year and I mean I didn't drink a lot of California wines when before I got there never did in my whole life always drank more uh, European wines just growing up on the East Coast the way it was but it wasn't until I left and came back and realized like it took three weeks for me to my palate to adjust the amount of alcohol and intensity yeah. of those wines and it, and after a while you're like I can only have a steak with this yeah. and I can't have it by the glass because you're just like, oh. yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's a night. Yeah, light is and, fine, you know. And the, uh, light is fine also for the fact that, um, you know, we're selling three wines and our focus is restaurants. So if we can make wine at 13% or 13.5%, that's got a bucket load of flavor. People are going to share a bottle. Yeah. People are going to, as by the glass, they're going to drink two. I mean, if you're a restaurateur, what do you want? You want people to drink as much as they can, not just one glass. Yeah. I mean, That's you a know, good point. Yeah, yeah, that just doesn't work to me. So, yeah, I, I, I like going to the states. I find it an incredibly varied market. I mean, every it's state true. and every city has got its own style, character, customs, and so forth, and. I think I can see, I can see the rumblings of a, a great wine drinking culture. It's not there. Um, you know, I've been going to England for twenty years, and England is a fully mature wine market. We sell a lot of wine into it. They understand wine. They, you know, in many cases, I mean, blokes will drink wine instead of beer. It's that just like New Zealand in some respect. America is still it's a long way behind. And I, yeah. Now, but. Talking about that, do they? Did you find? And I don't know how much like interaction you've had. Yes, I will have a little more wine. I don't know how much interaction you have, but I found, uh, and I haven't spent any time in the UK, but certainly with compared to New Zealand, that the younger uh, generation 
Like, I have friends that I grew up with that are just getting way into wine, and guys who I never would have imagined are into wine. Oh, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm into Argentinian Malbec, and I'm, in, yeah. you know, I've been drinking this French and this, and this California. And so I think, uh, I, you know, whereas my parents' generation, like, I'm kind of getting them and their friends into wine. I have yeah. aunt and uncles yeah. who are into wine, but, like, a lot of the them are uh, kind of looking, you know, catching up, yep. if you will. And whereas the young people are like, because. There's such a restaurant culture, particularly on the East Coast, and I can only speak from experience in D.C., Philadelphia, New York, Boston, those types of cities, that young people are real savvy with wine lists and, like, they know what's up, you know? I I reckon 10 years, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think the whole landscape of American wine will have changed, or wine drinking, not Mm -hmm. not so wine production. But I I noticed when when I was staying in a hotel in Fort Lauderdale, um, one night I was sitting at the bar and, you know, this is a fine dining restaurant. It's kind of the hotel's fine dining restaurant. And these two couples came down and they sat at the table and they were... One one of the couples was black and one was white. So it was kind of, you know, the classic modern sort of face of America in mm-hmm. some respect. Um, the girls came up to the bar and they bought two beers for the guys and two glasses of um, um, muscat or whatever for themselves, right? Muscat yeah. yeah, but the muscat came in um, a really smart-looking bottle. It was poured into beautiful sort of, you know, stem glasses, and it was chilled and so forth. So it was kind of, you know, an immaturity about wine, but a like and appreciation of how it felt to have a wine glass how it felt to order wine and so forth and they were young i mean they were probably you know you gotta be 21 to drink or whatever so they might have been 22 or 23 yeah, something yeah. like that <laughs> and it was no different from when asti spumanti in the 70s was kind of the drink that got everyone into wine so this is the drink that's getting them into wine and i i was really excited about it because i thought give them two years or three years and I'll be drinking New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Absolutely. And I'm sure that's happening. That scene is happening everywhere across America. It's kind of going from cocktails to kind of sweeter styles of wine or whatever, and next thing it's going to be wine as we know it. So I, I think there's going to be a huge wine boom in America, and I think New Zealand is going to be a part of it. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, I was really... Uh excited about just going through california last year um and how you figure somebody with their own so much of their own wine they were just give us more new zealand new zealand new zealand they yeah. like love it and uh and i could say the, again the same for the, um, the east coast and we're getting interest from all over the place you know? yeah so it, it's uh new zealand's done a really good job of keeping quality where it it should yeah. be and keeping a good name so i think and the uh, wines are so distinctive yeah that's the thing. I mean, you know, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, whether you love it or loathe it, um, there's no denying it's the most probably aromatic and in-your-face wine on yeah. the planet. And there is, that's got to be good. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's somewhere in your wine-drinking career where you're going to come to the stage where you're going to try and or come across your first glass of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and you're going to go, holy shit. Yeah. And you're going to love it yeah. for a while until someone who knows more about wine says, oh, you'll get over it. Or, um, you know, or, or you'll find something else you like. But it, it's in every wine drinker's, uh, you know, uh, graph Benchmark. of drinking. Totally, yeah, yeah totally. and And it's great. So Well, what's great about it is like, you smell it, you know it. Once you did it once or twice, you're like, I know what that is. So it's per- particularly for, you know, novice and people, like you said, who are just starting to get into wines. Like, there's nothing better than being comfortable with something going like, yeah, I like New Zealand. And I can pick them out and I know yep. what they're like and why yep. I like them and everything. So And then you move beyond it, but you've still got a good impression of New Zealand. Absolutely. So then when you come around to New Zealand Pinot Noir, New Zealand Chardonnay, New Zealand sort of bordeaux style reds and the funny thing about new zealand wine which is under under appreciated in some respect there is no country in the world which i think makes wines in the classic mold of the original styles with just slightly more fruit to it in Mm. some respect it's a modern take on the classic so you know 
Oregon make great Pinot Noir. I mean, you know, Washington State make great uh, make great Syrah. Um, California obviously makes great Cabernet and so forth. But if you look at the classics, I mean, if you look at um, Gimlet Gravel Syrah, you can't show. I, I'm yet to try any wine outside the Rhone that tastes as close to the original mm. as Gimlet Gravel Syrah. I am yet to taste probably any Bordeaux style red wine um, that tastes as close in style. I mean, it's got its own style, but Gimlet Gravel Syrah has got the acidity, it's got the slight herbal note, you know, and so forth of, of um, Bordeaux. New Zealand Chardonnay, so underappreciated. I mean, my God, I mean, the great New Zealand Syrahs taste like Burgundy. I mean, well, they've I got this amazing acidity I and life to them. Talking uh, with a guy uh, last week about how Chardonnay is like the most underrated th- thing about you know wines of, of New Zealand, and it's top to bottom. It's yeah. you know Fangare down to Otago. It's yep. like you, these Chardonnays, uh, they're so different all over the place, and and d- different amongst themselves and different to the rest of the planet, and it's like reinvented the varietal I think and it's it's uh, you know it's, and you go from Hawks Bay which you know uh, I think we certainly do uh, a certain style here that maybe the planet is a little more used to but it's great to pull out you know those Marlboro Chardonnays or an Otago yeah. Chardonnay the real mineral ones and uh, and and hand that to somebody and uh, who says they don't like Chardonnay and oh, you, know, I, you know try <coughs> this oh I think it's one of New Zealand's great wine so it grows everywhere i mean this thing about chardonnay it, it, it sort of it grows in every climate in the world quite honestly but New Zealand's got lots of climates yeah yeah I, I agree wholeheartedly but at the same time if burgundy is a benchmark i think that the great new zealand chardonnays are a pretty fair take on burgundy we're not trying and and the funny thing is what what i was sort of alluding to before we're not trying to make wines that taste like the originals we're trying to make wines hands off that that taste of where they came from and this is their new zealand vineyards but they just have this affinity and natural acidity which you find in new zealand wines and a sort of i think the wine industry's been we've been at it long enough that and it's sort of become this kind of much more natural kind of style of winemaking where Oaks being taken out of it, alcohols are being reined back in, and so forth. So the wines are approaching their classic French counterparts in some respect in a really nice way. But they've got that dollop of New Zealand fruit to them that make them unique. And I, I think New Zealand's got a big future and what, loads, what, lots uh, of stars. What New Zealand wines do you? drink when you're not drinking ask and you know some of your um your vital ask villa outside of villa stuff you know put that aside (coughs) obviously that's i well i i drink i mean peter would probably say i mean i drink a lot of um it sounds crazy um but drink a lot of french wine um just by the classics are the wines i aspire to and in in some respect or all the wines which I, yeah, I kind of understand they're of the earth rather than of, of the fruit in some respect. But classic wines in New Zealand, I mean, I think Kumiu make great wine. I love their Chardonnay. Um, I think Villa makes a great wine from um, around New Zealand. Um, I like Martinborough Pinot Noir, mm. and it's probably my favourite Pinot Noir. I'm sorry to everyone in Central Otago, but um, I really like the... Well, I'm, um, I'm happy to hear you say yeah, that because I mean, we're, we're venturing down that road. I mean, you know? Ma- Martin Bird tends to have this kind of slightly earthy yeah. robustness to, to the wines that, that I really like. I mean, you know, Central Otago makes globally unique Pinot Noir styles. I mean, yeah. they're just, they're incredible. But, you know, I, I kind of like the complexity of Arta Rangi or, or whatever. I mean, I think they make, you know, fantastic wine. Hawke's Bay, um, Gimlet Gravels, I think, is a magic piece of dirt. Um, we got issues with, um, um, you know, virus and, and clonal selections and so forth, but given what we've got, 
I think, you know, give us another 100 years or something and it'll be an incredibly hallowed piece of global winemaking dirt. Um, I, I think the terraces, I, I love just, you know, I'll get my plug in for that. I mean, sure. I think this hill in Bayview that's kind of our little hill of Hermitage, I think is incredible. Um, Marlborough, well, I mean, Marlborough, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling. I, I, I love, New Zealand makes great Riesling as well. Yeah, that's and the, the first great wine I had when I came to New Zealand was, uh, or a wine that just kind of stole me and maybe it was, you know, sort of feeling all caught up in it. The first weekend I was here in Hawke's Bay, I had a uh, um, Wire, Wire, Wire Rapa? That's the region right above Martin Barrow, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Why we're up, um, uh, Riesling that just, I mean, I drank the whole bottle myself. <laughs> I was like, yeah. this is amazing. Was it Why yeah. Rapper or was it Wiper? Uh, because. Well, it was, it was Trinity, so whatever. Oh, yeah, okay. Why Rapper. Why Rapper. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't make it anymore. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was like their 04, and it just had that real petrol, you know, and, and it does it, it. I find in New Zealand it goes to, into those really cool flavors sooner than other regions do. Well, see, I, I, I love Wipera as a, um, re a place to grow Riesling. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of those matches like Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Um, you know, a place like Pegasus Bay, who I think make fantastic wine, complex, rich, you know, really interesting wine. And, um, yeah, I think, I mean, their Rieslings are, are pretty special. Did you see special. any of that Riesling action in the U.S. when you were there? Was there anybody? Because um, there's, there's a bit of a upswing of that i don't think it's going to quite take over sauvignon blanc or anything but there's no. a lot of people doing that summer riesling and it's getting real popular there well, well saint michelle who distribute our wine in the u.s are the biggest makers of riesling probably in the world um so yes they i mean know. they'd know <laughs> and you know they they sell astronomical amounts of of riesling mm -hmm. i mean you know to hundreds of thousands of cases and it's like my god um but I don't know. I feel sorry for Riesling because it 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 stutters along, and every so often, and every wine writer who's ever written about wine writes up the next Riesling um, wave, and it never happens. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. it's just you know, it, it, people don't know what to make of it. They they don't know whether it's sweet, the dry. It's it's kind of viewed as a nana drink, so young people aren't going to drink it. It's but at the end of the day, every sommelier and every winemaker kind of rates it far higher than public. Yeah, that always seems to have the critics. And when I talk about, yeah, this <coughs> little upswing I'm seeing, it is with sommeliers and restaurants. I haven't quite seen it in the, the public mm. yet. I mean, I, yeah. I, I love it too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, whether it's, it's from the Mosul and it's like, you know, 8% alcohol or whether it's from... Um, Austria and it's fourteen and a half percent alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it, it it can make amazing wine. Um, well, we're gonna have to get to dinner soon. I think I, I don't even think we scratched the surface. On well, we didn't. No, what, what we because could talk about. But uh, that's what's good about this is I'll be back in January. We'll do it again. Uh, but I did want to ask uh, you brought up the question and I sort of hesitated to answer. What, 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 so what's your music you're listening to right now? Because I've always had a <coughs> bit of a music theme with this my, podcast. What do you? You'd my my favorite is a UK group called Alt J. Alt J. So it's Alt as in the keyboard dash J. Alt okay. J. And I read somewhere the other day. What, what did it say? It was um, folk step. Folk step. Instead and I thought, oh, dumpster. I thought that was an interesting analogy, but I've never heard music like it, so I like that. I like the new Beach House album, um, and Django Django from um, Scotland. Yeah. I like as well. So, whatever happened to my three? And I only briefly. I just remember now, as you're saying this, it was like a group of two girls from Sweden or something. Oh, um, first aid kit. Yeah, I um, like that for, as well. Yeah, yeah, I. I I remember I I'll play it for you shortly. Like, yeah, yeah, we'll have to we'll have to listen to that. But I haven't even touched on um, growing grapes in the terraces and co-fermenting Malbec, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc for the last ten years. I mean, where'd that come from? Why would you do that? Yeah, and your cement uh, fermenters and our eighty-year-old concrete fermenters and hand plunged with plungers that come from God knows. I mean, they were there when I was there. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, well, well, so we actually, don't need to inoculate anything because they, I'm sure the plungers are full of it. So. Well, yeah. One thing uh, that I I know I do want to. Uh, we're in no rush to finish or anything, but the one thing that is really cool about if you go up to uh, to Esk Valley to the winery, it is unique in that the all of New Zealand there's not a lot of history around. It's just such a young country, and certain stuff, you know, it has to get either rebuilt because of earthquakes or 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 built new because it needs to be earthquake uh, uh, fitted and all that. But uh, that is. That winery is older than, I mean, that's that was one of the early ones yeah. in Hawke's Bay. It was one of the Bird family that started yep. it? Or? 80, well, it's 80 years old now. So, you know, New Zealand context, one of the first in the country. And, you know, there's there's others, Tomato Estate, Mission, and so forth, but they're not now making wine in 80-year-old wineries. No, no, that's so totally different. So, as far as I know, it would be the oldest active winery in the country. And it's got trap doors and caverns yep. and, and 23 open top concrete fermenters which 23 i don't know yeah. what's that yeah, oh, okay so it's 23. i've only seen a dozen or something in that one area but no, I, it's, I haven't it's, had a good enough look around i guess no there's you know? i mean there's 23 and it wasn't random that the four and a half ton maximum um sorry maximum uh, capacity that the thickness of the concrete, the four and a half ton capacity, the fact that half of it's under the underground and so forth. Someone did their sums or had an understanding or something of, of temperature and of fermentation kinetic uh, kinetics 80 years ago because, you know, there's no temperature control. It's yeah. left to nature to do it for us. But what's our maximum temperature? 32, 33. Um, you know, these were designed by someone who knew... 80 years ago and they don't and know I, who it was nobody knows who it was yeah I, yeah, I don't know I mean yeah. it's probably stuff that's been passed down over the years um, so I love it I mean I in this day and age where um, you know energy input carbon footprint and so forth is, is important I mean here are we we're making red wines without any energy input the energy input comes out of our muscles quite yeah. honestly and that, yeah. that's it gravity fed winery I mean this is this is old school, but very modern at the same time. I love it. I mean, that's what we're about. Well, I think we're going to have to end it there and come back in January and talk more. <laughs> Tell you all about uh, um, what's happening in Napa. And we'll say goodbye from Cafe uh, Russell here. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get into uh, some dinner and... Um, Music. I, I, I will put in... Uh, I will say this. Uh, I will put up on the little website that we do uh, links to S Valley wines, uh, maybe a nice cheeky picture of Gordon. And, uh, maybe after we get off this, you can tell me a couple other, uh, and you links. can find us on Facebook. So yeah, yeah. We'll put all that up yeah. on the website so that people can, can check that out. Maybe even a map of, uh, you know, where up on the terraces, everything is. And, and, uh, I don't know. Anything else? That I, we well, want? I, I, if anyone's out there and actually listening to this, and I hope they are, yeah. um, if, if they want to um, contact me at, at Esk, I mean, just email me at Gordon R at EskValley.co.nz. Um, I'll happily show you around and oh, just cool. you know, I'll put so that, I mean, I've put that up too. I normally say people can email me. Nobody's as, as giving and sharing as you are, Gordon. You know. Well, you, you know, I mean, even my peers were like, "Yeah, just have them email you, and then, and then." Let so me you can just. Well, I mean, I like showing people who love wine around our cellars because it's who we are and what we're about. And Esk hasn't got a big advertising budget and so forth. That's that's not who we are. What we're about is having done it for a long time and having a lot of close friends around the world, mm. basically. So that's right. We have a small world. <laughs> couple two small world stories now one was a guy i went to high school with he ran into a new york in a new york wine shop right and he yeah. came, ended up coming down here for harvest which it was uh, new jersey when i first met him yeah well that's that's where uh that's where i went to high school so we went jason carson jay carson and then uh i walked into a uh tasting room in sonoma uh last year and I uh, started talking to this couple, and they said, oh, you're making wine in Hawke's Bay. We're old friends of Gordon, and uh, that's Sheldon Winery. 
Uh, they actually got couple. married, and they got married <laughs> yeah. in Esk Valley. And I just <laughs> it was, was such like, a good harvest. They got married. I was like, "This is uh, way too small. What's going on?" So, um, and we're gonna taste some of their wine tonight. So, if uh, I'm sure they'll listen. So, if anybody's listening, I know they they will listen. So, hi uh, guys. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll give you a full report and some uh, tasting notes and everything. I think we have a Pinot and uh, what's the other one? It looks like a blend of some sort, but we'll give you guys a full report and a little shout out to Sheldon Wines and go visit the tasting room and say hello to uh, Toby and, and uh, Dylan and uh, they're pretty much the same. They'll show you around and hang out and pour. I I tend to go there. I've gone there a few times to just drop off some wine and end up sticking around and catching a little buzz and have to sneak <laughs> out because they're very giving with the wine. So um, yeah, hopefully maybe someday we can get them back to New Zealand or you'll yeah. Get oh, back like to that. California or something like that, and we'll we'll talk all about it in January. And uh, cheers, thank you for doing it. And we'll 